we, we, we call this event Living with Loss. And we, we hold it usually in a hotel. Um, our Dublin event anyway happens in the Alex Hotel, um, in, usually in November. And we would be welcoming you in with teas and coffees. And we would have over 20 different support services, bereavement support services in the room um, with us. Um, we would also have on display the Irish Hospice Foundation Never Forgotten book, where, where people have paid tributes to, to those who, who have died. Um, and every year we've had the great support of Fanagan's uh, funeral directors to, to help us in that. So obviously we, um, we had to change our way um, of, of working and supporting and of um, welcoming people. Um, and move online. Um, so thank you um, for bearing with us while we trial this way of reaching out. Um, really, I suppose what, what I'm getting to is that this year has been a year like no other. Um, and it's a year really that is very clearly characterized by, by loss. Um, and it has been an extremely difficult time to meet death in, in your family um, and it's been a difficult time to mourn and a difficult time to mourn no matter what the circumstances were around the death or no matter when the death occurred a lot of us have been isolated so we we really would like to extend our condolences and offer some comfort to you all this evening um, and those of you who as you mourn, maybe your your husband or your wife, your your son or your daughter, your mother, your father. You could be mourning your, your grandparent or your own brother or sister, um, or you could be mourning your great friend. And um, we, as I said, extend our condolences to you. Um, what we aim to do this evening is really to provide just some perspectives on loss and grief and, and some information. Um, we aim to introduce you to some of the different supports that are operating ar around the country. And, and our hope is that you'll find this, you know, an informative space, but also a supportive space. Um, and it's very possible that you don't know yourself what you're looking for from the evening. So we just hope that some part of it um, serves a, a purpose for you. The, the format of the, the talk, um, I'll, I'll just explain to you so that again, you know the rhythm it's going to take and, and how it will work out through the evening. Um, because obviously and unfortunately um, grief happens to people of all ages, we're going to start with a, a short talk on children and grieving children and how as adults we can best support them. We'll be introducing you to Maura Keating of the Irish Childhood Bereavement Network and, and she'll have some, some words for you. Um, then we'll be talking and um, we'll be hearing some talk from Brefni McGuinness of the Irish Hospice Foundation and Brefni will talk about bereavement and loss um, but also some of the extra challenges that, that, that COVID um, has brought about and again hoping that, that some of what he has to share may be of, of use. Um, we will um, hear about all the services, as I mentioned, um, and uh, my colleague Amanda will run through those for you so that you can see just a lot of what is available out there. And our final speaker, um, Catherine, is a volunteer on the Irish Hospice Bereavement Support Line. Our, our hope is that it's not all just talking at you, um, that, as I said, we'd engage with questions and answers and we will have um, time at the end for all the speakers to, um, to join us um, in one group and to try and answer some of the questions that, that may have come up. So I hope that that gives you just a little idea of the, the shape of things to come. To begin properly our evening, 
um, what we wanted to do was to hold a, a short ceremony and a ceremony involving the lighting of a candle. Uh, it's, it's December and it's the darkest time of the year. Um, we think that for some of you joining us this evening, it's, it, it's the darkest times of your life. So we want to light uh, a candle as really just a, a, a flicker of a guiding light for you um, and also to be a glimmer of, of hope. So I'm going to invite um, a number of the bereavement services um, to light a candle to start our evening. Um, so if I could invite um, the services we spoke with earlier to turn on their cameras. And I'm hoping you can see the, the friendly faces um, of, of support here this evening. Um, and I'll ask each of the services now to, to light their candle. And I'll explain to you who's here. We have um, Debbie Brady from A Little Lifetime Foundation. And that foundation works with people who've suffered the loss of a baby um, uh, before or at birth or sometime um, um, in the early time after birth. We have Colleen Brown from Bernardo's and Bernardo's run a children's bereavement service. We have Norma Rowan from Embrace Farm and Norma runs um, a, a network of farm accident support. Um, and again, these services have websites with a lot of resources and videos. So thank you, Norma. We have Carmel O'Shea from Fela Khan and Fela Khan works with people who've suffered a, a stillbirth or a neonatal death. We have Emer Ivory from Pur Purple House Cancer Support in Bray, um, reminding us that um, part of cancer support is caring for those left behind. We have Nuala McLaughlin from the Samaritans um, and Nuala is there as are her colleagues 24 hours a day. We have my colleague Lorraine Curran from the Irish Hospice Foundation. And we have Vivian Nugent from Taurus Lakela Bereavement Support. And thank you. I think if we could just take a little moment while our candles are lit um, in memory of, of those who have died and in, in gentle thanks for those who, who support us. Thank you. Thank you, services, and I'll ask you to be safe with your candles and to and to turn your your cameras off. Thank you. I, I'm going to um, start the talks now by inviting um, our first speaker, and our first speaker is Maura. Maura Keating of the Irish Childhood Bereavement Network. And Maura is going to talk to us about um, children who are bereaved and about our role in, in being there for them. So thank you very much, Maura. Thanks, Orla. Thank you. Um, as Orla said, my name is Maura and I work for the Irish Childhood Bereavement Network. We're based within the Hospice Foundation and we're funded by TUSLA. And we try and support the development um, and the training and, and uh, the promotion of supports for ch children who've been bereaved and awareness about the needs of children who have been bereaved. And that's what I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about. For those of you who have children in your lives, um, you probably find it a bit difficult to talk to your children about how they're experiencing grief or maybe even understand the way they are responding 
to the loss of a loved one in your family. And it, it, it's really hard. It's, it's difficult when you're grieving yourself to try and be there and, and provide that support for children. As adults, our natural instinct is to try and, um, I suppose, shield and protect children from, from things as hard as death and dying. It's a natural instinct in us to want to protect them. But the reality is when somebody in our family has died, we can't change the circumstances. We can't fix it or reverse it. So all we can do is find a way to support ourselves and the children in our family, come to terms with it and move forward with their grief. As I said, it's not easy to have these conversations. And as adults, we often worry about maybe being asked questions we don't have the answers to. And just to say, it's okay not to have all the answers. It's okay not to know what to say. And children will understand because in some cases there isn't answers, um, but it's really important to, to have the conversations. And often we're afraid that we're going to upset the children or get upset ourselves. And again, crying is a normal part of grief. It's a normal part reaction to when somebody uh, that we've loved so much has died. We're all going to get upset. So, you know, I suppose we say, don't be afraid to get upset. Don't be afraid to of those tears. To give you a little bit of a sense of what's normal for children and how they respond and how they might react. Um, I suppose their understanding of death and dying is very dependent on the age they're at and the stage they're at. So younger children, and that would be from babies up to kind of the middle of primary school, in that age span, they really don't understand that death is final. They haven't got the ability to really fully comprehend. It's too complex and a concept for them. So what they will do is they'll talk, even if you explain to them that a person has died and that they're gone and then they won't be back, you will find, you'll probably notice that they might ask you a question or say things like, yeah, I know they're dead, but when are they coming back? Or they'll be back for Christmas, of course, or things like that. They, they'll still hear the words and no matter how many times you explain it to them, they, they will still have a lack of understanding that it is final and forever. They also might ask unusual questions that take adults by surprise a little bit because they don't really understand that when somebody dies that they don't have the same feelings that they had when they were alive. So they may say, are they not cold or lonely or sad that they're not with us and things like that. So we're, they're, we're often thrown by that as adults, but it's normal for children. It's their way of um, almost kind of getting it sinking it in and processing it and getting their, their head around it. So don't be afraid of those type of questions. They, they're very, very logical thinkers, children. And they're very, you know, and they ask these questions and it's their way of, of really trying to process it. And they won't really, until they get a little bit older, they won't fully understand it. So it's understandable that they will ask questions and that you'll find yourself maybe having to repeat. Or some children won't ask any questions, won't want to talk about it. Um, and maybe sometimes you might have to prompt them a little bit to, to get find out what's going on for them. As they mature and as they get a little bit older, as they move into the later parts of primary school and into secondary school, they understand death in a more um, realistic way and they understand it. But they still might hold on to that sort of those those thoughts where they don't want to accept it. They understand it maybe, but they don't want to accept it. They might still have little fantasies or even magical thinking that this person might be able to come back at some point. Um, so just to understand that might help you with some of the questions that they might ask. Um, it's also, you know, normal enough to expect that some children, you know, around the 10, 12 and, and later might feel that they're to blame for some reason that this has happened, might have some, you know, worries or concerns about things like that. And um, so they may need a lot of reassurance a reassurance that it was nobody's fault that this, you know, that this loved one had died and that they they didn't, it wasn't anything they did. And they also might get a bit nervous and worried that the other loved ones around, like people like yourselves are going to, something would happen to you. And again, it's a lot of reassurance and, and, and just um, repetition as well. You will notice maybe something different things in children's behavior that you won't see. As adults, 
when we grieve, we tend to be terribly overwhelmed all the time. Um, and it's just a weight on us all the time. Children feel the same emotions. Of course they do, but they behave in different ways with the, these emotions. So they dip in and out of their sadness. They dip in and out of grief. They use things like play as an outlet for their grief. It's like it's too hard to deal with all the time. So they use play as a cushion from the pain. They, it's almost like play is that familiar, soothing security blanket that protects them from the pain and the hurt of thinking about the, the grief. So they, they, they dip in and out. So you'll see that they might be terribly upset at some point in the, in the day or in the evening. And then within a short space of time, they might say, I'm go I, I want to watch my program or I want to play at my Lego or I want to go play with my friends. And you're kind of taken aback that, are they not, you know, are they not upset? But they are, they just dip in and out like that. And you'll, you'll notice that. And because they seem to be getting on and playing, sometimes we're afraid to have the conversations with them in case we bring them back and upset them. But it doesn't bring them back. They still have the same emotions. It just, it's important to, 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 to touch base with them regularly to find out what's going on for them. Because they can worry. They can worry and they can pick things up wrong. Because as I said at the beginning, particularly younger children, they don't really fully understand and get what this means. So they can get a bit confused. And sometimes the language we use can, we think as adults, we're, we're using nice soft words and euphemisms to make it easier for them to understand. But actually sometimes that language can confuse children more and cause them to get a little bit more muddled about what's going on. So for example, if we say things like, um, they're in a better place now and they're happy now and they're at peace. We feel that that's comforting and soothing. Um, and it's softer than saying, you know, the, the real words like dead and gone and buried and things like that. And we feel that those soft words are kinder. But for young children, they hear things like, well, if they're happy now, were they not happy with us? Or if they're in a better place, why can't we all go to this better place? So you can see that these little things can get children a little bit muddled and concerned. Um, and that's why it's really, it's really helpful to touch base with them, to talk to them, to explain to them. And don't assume they understand it because they won't get it in the first go. You'll have to keep repeating and explaining. Simple, clear language. And as, as direct and, and clear as, as you can, they won't want to sit down and have a big long lecture, but that sort of side by side when you're, you know, maybe driving in the car or you sit, maybe sit down with them on the floor and play Lego with them or sit and colouring with them, having those little chats and, and say, you know, asking them, have they any worries or concerns about, you know, their loved one that has died or any worries or concerns about how they're feeling or any sadness that they want to talk about. And just to get them to open up and tell you in their own words what's going on in their head because they may have picked up things. And even though we think we've explained it so clearly to them, it's, it's a really hard thing for little kids to get their head around. So just be prepared that they may get a bit twisted in their thinking. It's really important to talk to them and to get them to open up as much as possible. Now it's hard to do that because you're grieving yourself, you're in bits yourself and you don't really want to have those conversations. But if it turns into, you're having a cry together, you know, sometimes there's no harm in that. You're showing the children that it's okay to feel like this, that this is normal when you're grieving. This is a normal thing to feel when you've loved somebody that has died. And I suppose it's important to say that talking to a ch children about death and dying and grief and sadness is never going to be a once-off conversation. You, you might feel you've explained it all to them in and around the time of the death, but you are going to have that conversation multiple times, probably throughout their childhood, if the, if the death happened when they were quite young. Because as they mature, their understanding of what's happened matures, their ability to ask questions matures. And that really often gets parents off guard because they'd often say, you know, the death happened two years ago and they're only asking these questions now. How, are they regressing? And people always worry, are they regressing? And it's not that they're regressing. It's just that 
they're two years older. They understand it a bit more now. They have the ability, the language and the understanding to ask questions now that they, they couldn't have two years ago when they were maybe four or five. So it's not that they're regressing. It's just that they're maturing in their understanding and they're able to ask questions now that they couldn't ask before. So, so you know, that's don't be thrown off by that. Um, and I think it's important for us, I suppose, to say as well that, you know, very often parents worry that the children are going to be deeply affected, particularly if, if the loss has been somebody really close within the family unit and somebody really special to them. And parents often worry like this is going to have a lasting impact. Well, like us as adults, when we lose someone that we love, that will always stay with us in our hearts forever. But children will learn to deal with their grief and they'll grow and move forward with the support of family and friends. The absolute majority of children will not need external support. They'll get that support from the family, the friends and the community around them. And schools are really important. Talking to the school before they go back and having an arrangement about how the child, what the child wants to say, what the child wants to be said, because each child is different. Not every child will want to talk and not every child will want the teacher to say something to them. But it's important that probably school is the first place most children will go to outside of the family after a death. So it's important that some connection is made with the school and you have some agreement and you ask the child, what would they like? Would they like the teacher to say something or would they like them just to acknowledge it privately to them? Because acknowledging a child's bereavement is really important for them because often they feel like they're kind of the lost one in the family, that they aren't, you know, that all the adults are struggling and, and are in, you know, getting the support, but they're kind of left because they go off and play. It seems like they're OK, but it's important to acknowledge that they are still having the same feelings as well. The other thing to say is that there are services out there if you feel that your child may need some support. And sometimes if the loss has been very traumatic, if there are other stressors going on in the household, there may need be need for some support. There's services joining us tonight um, that specialise in support for children who have been bereaved. Bernardo's uh, bereavement, children's bereavement service is one of them. And there'll be details of their service shown at the end of the webinar on, on the slide with all the contact information. And Bernardo's provide um, a helpline and they also provide a intervention and um, therapeutic bereavement supports for families and uh, with children on a one to one basis. Another organisation that works in the community and, and through schools a lot is Rainbows Ireland and Rainbows do group work with children of a um, similar age group um, who've been bereaved. They do a kind of a, a, a one hour a week, nine week program um, in, in, in a lot of schools throughout Ireland and in some community settings. And again, their information is going to be up on the slides at the end of the evening. So I suppose just to, to, to move to conclusion, it's really important to, to find the opportunities to have the conversations with children. If you have young children in your family and even teenagers, getting them to talk sometimes isn't easy. But letting them know that you're there for them, letting them know that it's OK to talk. Now, sometimes they'll feel like they have to protect you. If they see you obviously very upset, they'll hide their own upset sometimes because they don't want to make you worse. And that's understandable. But every but when you when you feel OK, when you're able for it, every now and again, the arm around them, the chats, the little chats, the little short little chats, not the big long lectures, but the short little chats that say, look, you know, we all have bad days. We all have, sometimes we have good days, but we're there for each other. And if you're having a bad day, don't be afraid to come to me. And if I'm having a bad day, you'll know that, you know, and I'll talk to you. So just, just create that, that I suppose, support that you're in this together as well. And use opportunities that you can to dialogue and to talk. There's, a, there's a, an opportunity coming up that you might want to do as a family together, um, those of you who have young children, um, on the winter, winter solstice night, which is the 21st of December, at half six on TG Cahar. There's a little 
animation being a little film in animation form being uh, premiered for that night. And we'll put uh, the details will be on the slides at the end. But it's it's a lovely little animation about a little boy called Saul and his Nana dies and he's really, really sad. And he's only about seven or eight. And in his dreams, he worries a lot and he doesn't talk a lot. So in his dreams, he get he he kind of goes off into a little fantasy world and he goes on a journey to try and find the light that he's lost since his Nana died. And he meets his Nana in his dreams and his Nana helps him on his journey through grief. And it's a lovely little animation and it's done beautifully by an Irish um, film company and Fanula Flanagan voices the Nana. Um, so it, there is an opportunity for family maybe to sit together. It's a winter night. It's the 21st of December. It's coming up to Christmas. Um, have six on TG Car and watch that film and then maybe have ask, you know, give the children the space to have the little conversations and to talk about what's going on for them and do they what they identify with in that movie so again that will the details of that will be shown on the slides at the end and I'm going to finish now with a very uh, short little um, video that we made which has five simple steps about how to support bereaved children thank you Children grieve too, so what can you do? Acknowledge the tears. Talk. Tell me the truth. Have open, honest conversations using clear language. Explain. Explain things in a way that I understand no matter how young I am. Acknowledge. Acknowledge my feelings, encourage me to ask questions, help me understand and cope with my emotions. Reassure. Reassure me and be prepared to repeat things until I can fully get my head around it. Support. Support yourself. You can't mind me if you don't mind yourself. Talk, explain, acknowledge, reassure, support. Thank you so much, Maura. Um, and that's a, that's a really lovely end message that, that, that people can take away. Very much appreciated. Um, we will have a couple of questions for you that we that we will um, bring to you at the panel. Um, so I'm keeping an eye on the questions here. And um, so hopefully you'll be you'll be able to discuss that later on. Much appreciated. Thank, Thank you, you Maura. And just on that point about questions, we are um, answering some um, as they come up. And really what we hope to do is talk through most of them at the panel. If we don't get to ones in the panel, we will type an answer um, later on in the evening after the main talk is finished. So we will respond to you in some way or another. Um, now I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague, Mr. Brefney McGuinness. Um, and Brefney is the National Bereavement Specialist at the Irish Hospice Foundation. Um, and Brefney is going to talk to us about, as I said earlier, the, 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 the shape of, of loss, but in particular to consider some of the challenges that, that COVID has brought to us. Um, thank you, Brefney. Right. Thanks very much, uh, Orla, and uh, also to Maura. Um, and thank you to all of you for uh, coming along this evening. And I suppose, again, just as Orla has done to recognise um, for many people who are dealing with uh, loss at the moment, that this can be a difficult time. And um, I suppose to acknowledge the just the losses that people have experienced um and are dealing with uh, and hopefully that what i'm going to talk about may be in some way helpful provide maybe some structure um to think about 
uh, uh, your own losses and, and what might be helpful. I'm going to speak about a couple of things. Uh, as Orla said, the impact of COVID, uh, which has changed all of our lives. Um, a little bit around uh, grieving and, and uh, some uh, framework for, for thinking about our own grief and, and what to expect and what it can be like. Uh, and then I'm more going to do a small piece on preparing for Christmas as we're coming very close to Christmas now and just some small tips there around uh, things that might be helpful to consider for you. Um, and again, as Orla said, uh, please use the question and answer function down below. Uh, we will be monitoring um, the questions that come in and uh, we've two places where we're going to be uh, responding to questions after my talk in about 20, 25 minutes time. And then at the end, um, uh, Maura, myself and uh, Catherine and Orla will be around uh, and we'll be uh, gathering whatever questions are there and we'll do our best to, to answer as many of them as we can. Um, I'm going to uh, share some slides with you. So if you can just bear with me as I get that set up. And hopefully you can see, well, both see and hear these uh, slides. So again, just to outline what I'm going to cover, Firstly, COVID-19. Secondly, a little bit about coping with grief and loss. And thirdly, preparing for Christmas. Um, I suppose COVID has changed all of our lives uh, in many, many ways. Um, but I, particularly on a night like tonight, and, and I know from some of the questions that have come up in the question and answer function so far, um, there are many people dealing with very recent losses um, and uh, very painful losses. And I don't know if you can see, uh, or rec you might recognize this church. This is uh, the church in Balali in Dundrum, County Dublin. Um, and in that church, uh, when the first Irish person died from COVID, they put a little white cross on the outside of the church. And as time has gone on, you can see, hopefully in that picture, um, the number of crosses uh, which have literally covered the wall of the outside of the church and now the community centre as well. I think what it does is it gives us a little bit of a sense of the magnitude of loss that sometimes we can get lost in statistics and numbers, but each number and each statistic is a family affected by a loss. Um, a brother, a sister, a father, a son, a daughter, an aunt, an uncle. Um, and I think what's really striking in this photograph is the young man on his bicycle who literally stops to look at the magnitude of what COVID has brought to our island. And I suppose what we're doing tonight um, is maybe as a small community um, acknowledging and recognizing um, the huge, huge grief which people are experiencing. And we're looking there at the people who have died through COVID, but there are many others who have experienced losses during the pandemic and their grief has been made more difficult. Some of what COVID-19 has brought us in terms of challenges are obviously an unknown virus adjusting to it, and that certain sense of a loss of control. What we do know, and we found uh, through our bereavement support line, which uh, we will be talking about a little bit later this evening, um, is that losses through COVID can bring up previous losses, um, maybe losses we hadn't thought about, uh, and suddenly they can come back into our minds. That's a normal part of grieving, but it can take us a little bit by surprise. The fact of social distancing has really impacted on how we grieve. Um, having to be a part, one of the most natural things that we might want to do uh, when somebody uh, we care about is grieving is to express our support for them, 
perhaps physically through a hug or touching a hand or even when somebody close to us is dying to be able to hold their hand or, or touch them. And that has been made much more difficult because of COVID. Limited gatherings mean, and certainly in the earlier part of the year, smaller funerals. We may not be able to be present when our loved one dies. And if we are present, we may be wearing PPE. Um, we may not be able to attend or organize funerals. Um, there can be a lack of access to physical social support. For people who are grieving, they may have to grieve on their own. Now, there's pluses and minuses with that. Some people find um, grieving uh, on their own. And some people have said to us that, you know, actually, I, I, I'm glad I don't have to meet with that many people. It just makes it easier for me at the moment. And yet there are others who said, I actually find it really hard. What I really want is to be able to um, uh, have people around me who I can talk to or, or just cry with or express my grief in whatever way is appropriate for me. Um, there are opportunities as well, um, but these we have to be, I suppose, maybe uh, careful around just in the sense that, um, yes, there was a greater sense of community, certainly in the earlier part of the pandemic, and it has given us time to reflect and consider what is important. And we may indeed, in time, uh, grow through this experience, but I suppose uh, what we have to be very conscious of is that not to rush that and to allow us to be wherever we are at the moment and recognize that it is a challenging experience. I'm going to show a short video now and this is a piece uh, which was broadcast last night on Virgin Media and it tells the story of one family's experience of COVID um, and uh, death and I suppose maybe just to give us a chance to think of our own losses this evening and maybe to, to see perhaps some commonalities in our own experience, but also uh, to recognize what it is we're all experiencing. Losing a loved one is always difficult, but for some families dealing with loss during the first wave of the pandemic, the hardest part was not being able to say goodbye. Even though there was an age gap between myself and Francis of about seven years, like as you got older, you know, like he became a big brother and you kind of looked up to him. And my memories of Francis growing up was always music and the garden. Francis would be in the garden all day. I think that's where I got me green fingers was from Francis because you'd be copying what he was doing. And he was a fanatic for Elvis Presley. He was mad into Elvis Presley. He eventually, when he got married, he took his wife and his daughter over to Graceland. He was a Nelson man. He was a great father all growing up. He was always there for me. He was really, really reliable, very hardworking man. He worked all the hours that God gave him to give me the life that he wanted to give me. I couldn't have asked for a better dad. While undergoing cancer treatment, Francis tests positive for COVID-19. We got the phone call from Luke's and uh, they told us that he had COVID. And I, I turned around to my mum and I was like, I think this is kind of how it all, how it all ends, how it all plays out. We'd been ringing them up and asking, you know, how he was, had he gotten, had he like deteriorated. He was bad that particular day. So we went up that afternoon. We had to put on all the PPE, so the big blue gown, the gloves, the mask, I think the goggles. And we kind of only had just about kind of got it all on. And the nurse was kind of like, you know, you can come in and kind of rushed us in. And like it all kind of happened really quickly in the moment. And he was kind of gone within about maybe a minute or so. Like it just kind of happened very quickly. He did open his eyes and, and kind of looked at um, myself and my mom. Whether he knew kind of who we were as such, I can't say. I think he knew that at least someone was there. And I hope that he knew that it was us. Porik arrives at the hospital just minutes after Francis had passed away. Porik's wife Felicity captures an image that goes viral on social media, reminding us all that behind the numbers are real people coming to terms with loss in the most difficult circumstances. When I got to the hospital, Luke's hospital there in Rakar, Felicity said, they're in the room with Francis. And I said, um, 
Does, is there any way I can get in or anything like that? I knew myself that I couldn't. And I just thought, I just looked and I seen the bench. I knew which room Francis was in. We were, I was outside on the lawn and I said, yeah, I think, I think I'm going to lift that bench because I just, I just wanted to see him. I hadn't seen my brother because of the COVID restrictions. I hadn't seen him in over three weeks. None of the family had seen him. And yet we were with him day and night all the time. So I got the bench and I, I was able to lift it. It was light enough. And I put it up against the window. And we rang Betty to lift the curtains up. I said, pull the curtains up. I, I want to have a look. So it was a lovely spring evening, April evening, and the sun was shining. So I had to put my hands up against the window frame to look in. And I could see Francis. Even though it was so sad, I was happy in myself that I could see him. And I felt terrible sorry for Betty and Rachel just in the room on their own. I would have loved him just be in there. Just to want to hold your brother and say a last goodbye to him. It, it, it was terrible not having that connection. So that, in a way, that bench gave me the chance to see my brother. The circumstances in which people are losing loved ones often in healthcare facilities where they can't visit, and then the the grief that's associated with that, and then not being able to have the support of family and friends in the way that normally happens, the marking at the end of somebody's life. Talking to people who had friends who had passed away, who had family who had passed away, be it from COVID or, or, or something else, and they couldn't mourn properly, they couldn't go to the funerals. Numbers and statistics were being produced every night, but they weren't numbers and statistics. They weren't numbers and statistics. They were our friends and our family who couldn't grieve. And they weren't, they weren't nameless people and they weren't faceless people. Behind every, every number is a family, is a person. And, and we're really, really conscious of that the whole way through. I, I remember early in the pandemic in, in one of our press conferences, Ronan Glenn was asked about this, was asked about, this isn't fair, is it? The way people have to grieve now. And I remember him looking up and saying, nothing about this virus is fair, nothing about this pandemic is fair, and he's so right. And I suppose um, I'm, I'm left with, with many thoughts from, from those clips, but I think what Ronan Glynn um, said at the end, uh, nothing is fair about having to grieve this way, and nothing is fair about this pandemic. Um, and I suppose just this evening to recognise the unfairness uh, of, of the situation that uh, we find ourselves in, particularly um, if you have lost a loved one, um, if you're grieving for somebody, um, and maybe just to recognise communally that it, it is unfair um, uh, and, and it is difficult. There are things that can help us a little bit, and we're going to have a look at some of those. And um, part of, of what can help is being able to express our grief and finding ways to support each other um, and finding ways to be able to listen to each other's story um, and to be human to each other. I'm going to have a quick look at uh, the grieving process and uh, as a framework which might help us uh, to find some of those ways where we might be able to understand ourselves, understand others and support ourselves and support others. Um, one of the ways uh, that we know helps us when we're grieving is to be able to express our grief in ways that are, um, I suppose, uh, helpful for us, uh, and that's going to be different for different people. Uh, Shakespeare talks about the importance of giving sorrow words um, and the importance uh, of finding the ways to express our grief. Um, and I think there are different ways that we can do that, but 
the important thing for us if we're grieving is to find that safe place or safe person or uh, safe people with whom we can do this. Um, and our grief isn't always pretty and it's not always nice. Um, and Maura mentioned this in relation to, to children. Uh, we can't change what's happened when somebody dies. We will be upset. We will be wrought with grief. We will be uh, in pain at times. Um, and finding uh, people or a person who can just allow us to be how we are and express our grief in whatever way or shape or form it's taking at that particular moment or that particular day can be really, really helpful. Some of what we know are normal feelings when we're grieving, um, and these aren't all of them, but they're a selection of some of, of the feelings that we know are normal, are things like sadness, anger, guilt and self-reproach. And I know there's been a couple of questions tonight in the question and answer around guilt. It's normal to feel guilty uh, when somebody dies. We look back on the things that uh, we might have done, or maybe we had an argument with somebody or we weren't as nice to them as we could have been. That's normal. And over time, hopefully, we, we work our way through that. Um, but it's helpful sometimes to know that this is a part of grieving. Loneliness, fatigue, grief is terribly physically tiring. Um, and one of the really good pieces of advice someone gave me when I was grieving was, um, look after yourself physically get sleep, um, look after your diet um, and allow that you're going to be physically tired and, and mind yourself around that. Um, oops, sorry. Listen, there's sorry no about that. right that jumped on too way. quickly. Um, I'm just going to show you a little uh, video and this is on uh, the grieving process. It's an animation um, and it just is a nice way, I think, of giving us a bit of a, a sense of what the grieving process is like. So have a look at this and see if anything strikes you as helpful. And again, I would encourage you to use the question and answer function below if there's a question that you want to ask either myself or the panel around this or other parts that we're talking about. Hey, to deal with the loss of a loved one. You can expect grieving to be rough and it's different for every single person. Another important thing, it's not just a matter of coping with loss, it's about coping with change. And that, Wellcasters, takes a lot of time. Today on Wellcast, we're dealing with a pretty difficult subject. How do you deal with the death of a loved one? How do you live your life in the face of a life-changing event? We don't have all the answers. And honestly, you're going to have to work through your pain in your own way, at your own pace. But if you're looking for it, we do have some advice. First things first, you need to remember that grief is a process and not a task. You might have heard of a popular theory that breaks up bereavement into stages. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. While you might identify with some or all of these steps, you gotta remember that grief is less like a staircase and more like a roller coaster. There are peaks and dips and they don't always happen in predictable ways. You might feel better for a while and then worse, and that's okay. It's natural to have an uneven journey with your grief. Don't be afraid of the pain. You shouldn't try to stuff your sorrow away into a place where you don't have to deal with it. It's just going to stay there. In order for you to work through your grief, you're first going to have to acknowledge that it exists. There are a lot of ways to do this. You might have to be alone for a bit. Maybe you need to write down your feelings in a journal or talk to someone. Do things that make you happy. When you're grieving, it's sometimes difficult to hold on to who you are. After all, so much of your energy is focused on the mourning of your loved one, which is fair. But it's easy to get sucked into a mind space where you can't even remember your former self. We want to tell you it's okay to take time to do the things that make you feel like yourself and give you joy. Recognize the relationship between the mind and the body. When you're experiencing grief, 
it's really easy to forget the things that you usually do as a matter of routine. Taking a shower, getting enough sleep, eating. Neglecting your physical health is only going to take a greater toll on your mental health, which is taking a pretty significant hit right now. So do yourself a favor and do us a favor and make an effort to take care of you. It's what your loved one would want. Reach out. Well, casters, if you take nothing else away from this episode, please remember this. You do not have to be alone in your grief. If your feelings are too overwhelming for you to sort out, that's okay. But go to someone else for help. It can be someone you know, a family member or a friend, or it can be a therapist or a professional who knows how to help people deal with this exact situation that you find yourself in right now. Just the act of talking out loud about your feelings can be incredibly cathartic. Finding someone who can help you sort them and work through them is even better. So some good pieces of advice there. Um, I think the some of the main ones being look after yourself. Um, reach out for help. And again, uh, we will be mentioning the bereavement support line later uh, as one of the places where you can turn to for that help. Um, But that piece about looking after yourself, so, so important. What I want to look at now is um, a framework that we can use for understanding our own grief uh, and maybe the grief of others. Uh, This is uh, a way of thinking about the grieving process. You might have seen in the um, animation that uh, the person mentioned stages of grief. And we don't really think about that as being linear anymore. Uh, A different way of thinking about how we grieve is this idea of what we call a dual process uh, model of coping. And what this tells us is that we're all hardwired to cope with grief. That's our natural ability is to cope with grief. And our natural ability is to do two types of coping. The first type of coping uh, is loss coping. And the second type is restoration coping. And what we do is we go backwards and forwards between these two types of coping. And at the time of a death, we may focus more on the loss coping, which is where we miss the person, and where we get what we call grief bursts. And grief bursts is where you get a burst of grief coming at you. Some people call it a wave of grief and anything can set you off. It could be a song. It might be a smell. It could be something somebody says to you. And it's almost like you're right back into uh, the, the start of the loss and the start of the grief. The strong emotions, some of which I showed there earlier, shock and trying to understand what has happened. All of these loss copings are to do with the person that you have lost. And the restoration coping is that bit of what am I going to do with my life now as a result of this loss? That means trying to deal with things and adjusting to the new reality. Um, It means adjusting to a new normal. We've heard that an awful lot at the moment. Um, But restoration coping is how am I going to live my life now as a result of this person dying. And what we do is we go over and back between loss coping and restoration coping, or if you like, thinking about the loss and thinking about restoring my life. Interestingly, one of the really important parts about restoration coping is that I need to take breaks from the loss coping. It's actually okay sometimes not to be thinking about the loss. In fact, it's good for us to do that. Um, That's provided we can also spend some time thinking about the loss. But that's really interesting. And the way we cope with grief is that we go over and back. We need to be able to do both of these types of coping. That is, we need to be able to focus on the person, to allow our grief bursts, and also to be able to... um, get breaks from it and think about, okay, what am I going to do now? How am I going to adjust? One of the areas we might be thinking around that is, okay, what am I going to do for Christmas? And I'm going to come to that in a little bit. Another thing that's really important uh, uh, to think about is that people grieve in different ways. And um, 
we might have thought in the past about men and women grieving differently. And I, if I was to say to you there, uh, even to think, what do you think? Do you think men and women grieve the same way? I'm not sure what your response would be, but often I hear people coming back and saying, um, well, actually, no, men grieve one way, women grieve another way. And oftentimes the way that we think of men grieving is that they um, problem solve or they respond through activity or work or they keep it to themselves or they don't share. And with uh, women that they grieve by talking uh, about and expressing their feelings openly and getting together with others. And these actually describe two of what we would call grieving styles. And both of these styles are appropriate. This is really interesting. Um, and they're like two ends of a spectrum. So you have what we call an instrumental style of grieving, which is often associated with men. And that's, if you like, people who do their grief and who process their grief through activity, problem solving, etc. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have what we call intuitive grievers. And that's people who feel their grief and who have a need and desire to talk about and express their feelings. As I said, both of these styles are appropriate. And you can have people who are intuitive or instrumental. And most of us are a bit of a mixture of both, but generally with one style dominating. This can be really helpful to bear in mind, particularly coming into the season we're coming into. In a family, you can have people who will have different styles of grieving. And it can sometimes be helpful to think that, OK, my way may be different to my brother's way or my sister's way or my dad's way. But that doesn't mean that they're not feeling the grief. Um, they just have a different way of expressing it. And another, um, I suppose, uh, concept that might be helpful for us in relation to our own grief is thinking about the goal of our grieving. Uh, and it might be hard to think about goals at the moment, particularly if, if your loss is very recent. But this might help maybe in the future to think about this. And this is the idea, like, what are we aiming for in terms of our grief? Um, and if you have a look at this drawing, there's two sets of jars. If we look at the jars on the top first, um, these three jars represent a way of thinking about how grieving works and what the, the goal of our grieving is. And this, the top jars are called shrinking grief. And this, if you think about you, uh, as being the jar and the black ball being the grief that you experience. Um, and in the first jar on the left, you can see that the black ball fills the jar. And in the second jar, as time goes on, a traditional view would have been that we shrink our grief or our grief gets smaller. And then in the third jar, further along in time, eventually the, the grief gets even smaller and eventually it almost disappears. We hardly feel it again. And what a lot of people said from their experience was, this doesn't match my experience. A more helpful way of thinking about the goal of grieving is the idea of growing your world. Um, and again, this idea is that you are the jar um, and the black ball is the grief. And in the first jar on the left, on the bottom set of jars, again, you can see the black ball fills the jar. But as time goes on, rather than trying to shrink our grief or get rid of our grief, the idea is that we grow our world around our grief. And our grief stays with us. We don't forget the person who has died. Um, we don't ever, I suppose, feel that we we, we don't have feelings for them. Those feelings may change, but we remember them. We bring them with us in our life, but we grow our life around their memory and their loss. We learn to live with their loss, which is different to trying to get rid of it. In fact, what we try to do is encourage people to remember the person. As Maura was saying earlier, talk to kids about the person who has died. Yes, it may be very difficult and we may get upset, um, but that's okay. The important thing is to remember the person and to allow ourselves to um, be able to 
bring that person into our lives in a new way and expand our lives around that person. So just some points around loss and grief. Um, it's normal to ex experience intense emotional responses after any death. There isn't a right way to grieve. Each of us is very individual and uh, our grief will be individual. Even in the same family, people, as we saw there with the different styles of grieving, can grieve in different ways. Grief is a journey. It's a process. It takes a different length of time for each person. Routine can be helpful, provided that routine allows us also to dip into our loss feelings. Um, so again, as we were showing in that um, dual process, the two types of coping, we need to be able to do both. We need to be able to dip into our grief and we need to be able to step away from it and dip into it again and step away from it. And to be very gentle with ourselves. And I think especially at this time, um, especially given the year that we've had and, and the pandemic that we're in the middle of, it's especially important to be gentle with ourselves. Um, grieving is a marathon rather than a sprint. It takes generally longer than we think. And again, just that idea of being extra kind to ourselves. And what helps us when we're grieving? Firstly, to allow yourself to grieve, uh, to honour your grief, to honour the person who has died. Express your grief in your own way. Care for yourself. Look after yourself physically, emotionally, um, psychologically, spiritually. Looking out for others can be really good as well. Um, and that way, sometimes of just thinking or uh, getting in touch with somebody else, maybe who also has lost someone and even just recognizing um, uh, who uh, somebody else who may be in similar situations. There's a great solidarity in, in being able to to just check in with somebody and, and acknowledge that this might be a difficult time for yourself. Seek support and avoid isolation. Um, Maura mentioned some of the uh, organizations that provide support for children. Amanda's going to speak about some of the adult organizations and Orla is also going to speak about the bereavement support line. These are options for you and for others um, in terms of uh, what is available. Oops, and of course I've jumped on, sorry about that. Um, I'm just going to play a short video. And again, this is uh, from um, uh, a man's experience of, of the death of his mother. And again, maybe just what I've outlined there in terms of the dual process and the different ways that are helpful. Just see what strikes you in this video. A Dublin man whose mother died from COVID-19 has thanked the staff at her nursing home for what he said was exemplary care. The Irish Hospice Foundation has recommended that anyone receiving end-of-life care should be allowed to have a loved one present before they die. Dermot Sreenan lost his mother Bridget on Easter Saturday after she contracted COVID-19 at a nursing home in County Kildare. He was able to hold his mother's hand to say goodbye after being supplied with a visor and full protective clothing. It's like being in full Breaking Bad costume with a visor, a welder's visor and hairnets and galoshes and everything else. So uh, it was very difficult. So I just held her hand and I just said that she'd been uh, an amazing mother and that she touched many people's lives. Bridget Sreenan was 88 years old and had a chronic underlying condition. She was being cared for at Craddock House Nursing Home in Nace. When she got diagnosed, she said to me on Skype, she said, I think this thing will finish me. And I said, you just got to do the right thing and fight it, I said, and do whatever the nurses ask you to do. And she did fight it, but she didn't, you know, she didn't win. Well, I'm going to be eternally grateful to the care home for just the level of care that they gave to my mom. They are, yeah, they're exceptional people. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, Bridget's daughter Geraldine was unable to leave the US to attend her mother's funeral. 
Only 11 people were present for the 10-minute graveside service. Friends and family were instead asked to wear purple, Bridget's favourite colour. My mum was uh, quite vivacious and really loved life and was always up for everything. Dermot and his sister plan to celebrate their mother's life with a special mass on her anniversary next April. Sharon Gaffney, RTE News, Dublin. So I'm just going to uh, finish here with with some tips for um, planning ahead for Christmas. Um, And these are just some simple ideas maybe to think about. Uh, I suppose just bearing in mind that Christmas is just one day, um, but Christmas can be a difficult time. uh, And and sometimes the expectations that are there that everybody will be happy, it can be even more poignant if you're grieving or if you're dealing with uh, the death of somebody close to you. Some of the things uh, to think about are to plan ahead for the day and to have some plan for yourself about how you would like to spend the day. You can always change it if you need to. Um, Find some way to honour your loved one that may be lighting a candle or a minute silence, maybe to remember your loved one. Ask for help. Again, we've mentioned that a couple of times look after yourself and that's a bit of just build some time in for yourself helping others might also be an option but again if that fits with you and and I would say firstly look after yourself and then see if if the helping others uh, works limiting your alcohol intake can be good Um, uh, it's nice to celebrate and, and it doesn't mean you don't celebrate like that but just to watch that alcohol can actually um accentuate maybe our 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 emotions. Fresh air and exercise, if we can build some of that in. Very importantly as well, allow yourself happy moments. You may be surprised there may be lovely moments and happy moments that arrive and to take those. And I suppose also accepting that others have different ways of grieving. So I'm going to skip through to these and I'm going to finish uh, with this. This is a quote from Paula Darcy. um, And Paula is a woman whose um, husband and child were killed in a car crash. And she wrote a, a book about grief called When People Grieve. And she talks about how grief changes us. Grief is the heart's response to any deep loss. There are many deaths in life and we grieve all of them. We mourn the loss of employment, the death of our pets, infertility, divorce, and each death and disappointment experienced within our relationships. We mourn losses set in motion by natural disasters and acts of terror. Grief has been both my great teacher and the hardest work I've ever done. It cut me in two, excising my innocence and my illusions. I learned to be gentle with myself and I learned that there is no right way. I learned that my relationship with those who have died is not severed by death. I know them in spirit, within my heart, in a new way, and it all took time. Thank you very much for for that, Brefni. Um, and I can see from the questions that 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 a lot of what you said was was ringing through for people, and and we hope now um, towards the the end to talk particularly about the death of a parent, um, and and sometimes when parents seems to have died um, suddenly, um, and and how people have reacted. And you mentioned some responses there such as grief and anxiety and guilt um, and people have have been saying on the questions and answers that it's um it's important to hear that those are a part of grief um, but maybe how how will we how will we work with them so towards the end we'll, we'll have questions on that and um, thank you briefly um, I think also in support of Brefni's uh, talk and uh, as he said, that idea of trying to um, look at uh, how you might support yourself at Christmas, an important thing might be to know, well, who's out there for you and um, particularly in terms of services. So I'm, I'm going to invite um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Amanda Roberts, to just give a quick um, overview of the services that are out there. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks a million, Orla. 
Um, my name is Amanda and I work with the bereavement tier team here in the, uh, in the foundation. I suppose as Orla has already said, we've had this event every year for the, over 10 years in the Alex Hotel in Dublin City. And the, uh, the organizations are a real big part of the event every year. And what when you walk into the room, you're surrounded by over 20 organizations that have stands there and people there to kind of chat to and you could pick up leaflets of the organizations. So we're trying to, we, so obviously we can't have it in person this year, but it's trying to give that sense of there is support, support out there. I suppose the way we're trying to do that tonight is um, try to, I'm going to I kind of group a couple of organizations together in a slide and have about nine slides just to kind of give a sense of kind of what organizations are out there. And what's great about the Living With Loss event in person is sometimes you don't know if you're struggling and you find it really hard to make that first step and be going to this event and having people there from the services picking up a leaflet or just kind of checking in with the service and i suppose just to let you know if you do see a service tonight on any of our slides i'm going to have more information at the end of the night tonight with the cut the phone numbers the websites all the contact details and i work with these organizations on a day-to-day -day basis and please if you see any organization at all just pick up the phone give them a ring uh, you might find that this organization suits you, you might find it doesn't, but just please pick up the phone if you find that you are struggling and you do find an organization that you feel might meet your need. So I'm just gonna share my slide uh, here just to kind of give a bit of a sense of what sort of organizations we have. I'll show you now. And I've only got about nine slides, but it's just to give you a bit of a sense of what we have out here. So the first organization, uh, I suppose, just to say before we even get into the organization is that all of us need support from family and friends after someone close to us dies. And some of us will need some additional support for a wide range of reasons. And there is a, a, a range of reading supports out there. And some services are open to anyone who is bereaved, whereas others offer support to a particular type or a group of kind of bereaved people. So some organizations are for uh, some services or organizations are for family and friends who've lost someone to a particular type of death so for example a death through cancer or chronic illness suicide farm accident homicide or road traffic accident some are based on the relationship you had to the person who died for example the death of an infant or a pregnancy loss a child and that includes an adult child as well some services are for uh, the loss of a spouse or a partner or a sibling and then some services are out there are not actually bereavement specific, but they are still support services. So things like information services like citizens information and citizens information have a wealth of information about a wide range of areas, but a lot they have a lot good information around uh, bereavement and death. You know, the particulars around death, like registering a death and all those kind of practical pieces that you need to know after a death. And also other general services like general counselling services. I suppose it's important to know that some counsellors actually do have that little bit of an additional training to support someone who is struggling with a bereavement. The first group of services I just want to kind of go through here are these are the services for um, supports for people who have experienced pregnancy loss or when a baby dies in and around at the time of birth. And we have two representatives here tonight. We have Carmel from Failicon and Debbie from A Little Lifetime. And these organizations have really good information on their websites. They have booklets and leaflets. And this information, a lot of it will be practical information, but some of it will be around kind of what people can experience after this particular type of death. And A Little Light, a Lifetime would have a free counseling service as well. And again, at the end of the, uh, the night tonight, I'll have all the contact details for these organizations. Just the second group of the nine groups I'm going to show you tonight is the parental and sibling support. And we have two particular organizations here, Anam Cara and First Light. So Sharon, the founder and the CEO of Anam Cara, they would have a wide range of services within their organizations. Particularly, they would have really good videos and information and booklets around kind of this experience of this sort of bereavement. They have well established support groups. And actually quite interesting, in the last year or two, they've collaborated with Felicon and Pieta because what they found is they had a lot of bereaved parents come to the events who had were bereaved through suicide or had kind of deaths of kind of in and around birth. And so what they did is they came together to provide kind of support to all kind of types of bereaved parents at the event. 
another service here would be First Light. So they, Georgia would be the clinical director there. So if you ring that service, you will get to chat to, uh, to, to Georgia. And this is a service more for bereaved parents that experience a sudden death. And they would have a good uh, network of counsellors, free counselling around, around the country. The third group here will be the cancer support service. And we have Ema here from Purple House. And these provide professional cancer support and bereavement support to people affected by cancer. And I suppose an important thing to know here as well is if your loved one died under the care of a hospice, whether it was inpatient, daycare or community care, they have a lot of the hospitals would have bereavement support. And as a, a relative of a patient who died under the care of the hospice, you can access those services. And if you contact the hospice directly, whether it's the social work team or the bereavement team, they'll be able to let you know what sort of services they actually have at that, uh, that particular hospice. The next group I'm going to go through here is the suicide supports. And we have um, Teresa Michaela, we have a Vivian here from Teresa Michaela, and that would be kind of more of a, a local based service based in Kildare. And then we have Pieta as well, it's more of a, a national service. And Pieta would offer kind of two types of services, kind of the liaison service, which offers that support initially after the death. And then they'd have a more therapy service that people more would want more take up down the road a little bit. The next group here would be the accident um, accident kind of support uh, services. And we would have met Norma here at this very start here tonight from a Brace Farm and their farm accident support network. And they would have information remembrance events within their, their network. And I suppose more recently, Norm, Norma was telling us yesterday that they more recently published a book with stories by widows, who, widows whose partners have died of farm accidents. And sometimes for people, it sometimes helps to hear from people who have experienced a similar loss. So this might be a, a good book to read if you've experienced a death through a, a farm accident. The other accident support service would be the Irish Road Victims Association. Donna Price would be uh, the founder there. And they have a really good book around kind of, if, if you have experienced a death through road traffic um, accident, they have a lot of a kind of a good book around kind of the practical issues around after the death. For example, um, the, the, car, the kind of coroner um, process and the Garda investigation process. So it would be a good book to read if that's something that you have experienced. Kind of just the third last slide here I'm just going to show you today is two particular organisations that would provide support after a homicide. And uh, so we'd have Advec would be a national organisation and also support after homicide would be another organisation. And support after homicide would have particularly trained volunteers to provide the so sort of support someone needs after a homicide. So particularly I would have met Margaret and Liz and Trina. And what they do is they give practical information regarding all the stuff that happens after a homicide, like inquests or the trial, and particular issues that arise after that sort of um, experience of a death. Now, just this, the second last grouping here I'll show you is just around the helpline and information uh, kind of services out there. And I kind of mentioned Citizens Information Service before earlier on, and they do have a wealth of information, particularly around the practical stuff around um, after a death. And I know Catherine's going to talk just after myself around the bereavement support line. And that's another avenue that you can look to get more, whether it's information or whether you want to link into someone just to kind of get a little bit of support around how you're feeling. And then also the final here on this slide is Samaritans and Nuala is here from uh, Samaritans. She would have lit a candle at the start. And these provide conf confidential support to anyone who needs to talk. And it's not just bereavement, but any sort of kind of uh, issue that people are experiencing. And these would be 24 uh, uh, service seven days a week. And then just the, the second last slide here would be two particular services, one around, around the death of a parent, and that would be Colette from Widow.ie, and they have a good information on their website. Now, it's a particular peer support service, and their main service would be an online forum, but they're particularly good guest writers that would they would publish on their blog particular topics that they would have other widows um, kind of writing blogs on would be if they're experiencing accessing entitlements or coping with Christmas or how to help a recently bereaved widow and tips for people trying to support people. And then just kind of the last slide here, not everyone um, that is looking for additional support will need counselling. A lot of people um, would find the support they need with a support group or with a, a kind of a trained support listener volunteer to, to kind of link in with and chat with. But what we find here is that from counselling, there's a kind of a couple of avenues that people can access counselling. And we have here them on the slide. So counselling in primary care will be free to medical card holders. 
voluntary organizations would have free counseling for people that are, are eligible. So a little lifetime or first light employee assisting programs. And at the moment, my mind is offering free counseling to those el eligible. So these would be people impacted by kind of COVID related issues and it'd be an online service. There's also a lot of low cost counseling services as well, which is small fee attached. And then there's also private therapists as well, which have a fee attached. But what I'm going to do is, as I said earlier, at the end of this um, talk tonight, I will have a lot of slides kind of running on loop to give people more information, more links and more fo phone numbers that they can ring to find out more information about it. And I suppose, I suppose to recap before I hand you over back to Orla, it's just that if you would like support, there's loads of different avenues you can find out about the support. So whether it's contacting the organizations themselves or picking up the phone and giving them a call, whether it's contacting your, your GP and see if they're aware of any services locally, or even give them a call on the breathing support line. If they're not aware of a service in your area, they'll find out about one and get back to you about it. Um, thanks a million. Orla, back to you. Thank you so much, Amanda, um, and for those resources, as you said, that they'll be available for people um, uh, through the through the rotation, but also you'll be emailing them on. Um, and the reason why we're trying to make sure that you have all this information is that bereavement is isolating and confusing. And what we hear all the time is it's very difficult to know where to turn. Um, Amanda mentioned there um, the IHF bereavement support line, and we set that up in um, just in June of this year. Um, so we've talked to many people, about 650 people at, at this point. Um, our, our number is uh, in the resources that, that Amanda mentioned, um, and we're really wanting to, I suppose, put forward the human face of this service. So so um, I'm going to invite Catherine um, to tell us her experience of, of working on that line. And when I say working, she volunteers her time. Um, she's a, a professional and a very skilled professional um, and gives up her time every week um, to, to, to answer calls. Um, so thank you so much, Catherine, for agreeing to, to let us know your experience. Thank you, Orla. So my name is Catherine. I'm one of the volunteers on the Irish Hospice Foundation Bereavement Support Line. And it's a real privilege for me to work on the support line and to connect with people who are going through a difficult time dealing with grief and the other many losses in their lives, particularly at this time with COVID-19. So our own social network and support are often enough to get us through the difficult process of grief, but sometimes people need a little extra support particularly during the pandemic when grief is amplified and further compounded uh, by the COVID-19 restrictions and the feelings of isolation and loneliness that many are experiencing at this time. So on the support line, we offer comfort, sympathy, reassurance, education on the grief process, information reconnections and supports available both in the caller's local community and at national level as well as information on practical support and other useful resources. Sometimes what's needed is to give the caller the space to think things through. You are there to support them with sensitivity while they experience, express, and try to come to terms with their feelings and the myriad of emotions that are going through, which is all part of grief. If the caller needs assistance outside of your capacity, you signpost them to the appropriate service, such as their GP, local support groups, counselling, such as our citizens information, etc. Every grief is unique, just as every griever is unique, and you give the caller the time to express their grief in whatever way they can. You encourage them to share their stories as you listen with care and compassion to those stories. Some are heartwarming, some uplifting and inspiring, and some extremely sad, but all stories precious, all cherished, and also important as witness and tribute to the lives of the loved ones. So having come from a nursing background where the aim is to remedy and heal the ailment, sometimes it can be a challenge for me to offer companionship and compassion without being able to fix the problem. But grief cannot be rushed or fixed. Grief is not an illness with a prescribed cure. 
It is a normal response to loss and it is the process that allows you slowly to become accustomed to life without your loved one being physically present. Experiencing the pain of the loss is a necessary step towards healing. Grief, like a tunnel, has to be gone through in order to get through. So together with the caller, you try to navigate a way through. You work out a plan of future action or a way forward. You help and enable the caller to identify their own strengths and to summon their inner resources and resilience that will help them to cope as they work through the grief and pain of the loss. We might ask questions like, who can support you in this? Who would be helpful to share it with? What has helped you with distress before? And maybe help identify and connect with the useful resources that are out there. You know you have helped when callers make comments such as, that has been really helpful. Thank you for listening. Thank you for all the useful suggestions. Thank you for reminding me of all that I have to be grateful for. Thanks for explaining it so well. I now feel much better. I thought I was going mad. Thank you for making me feel normal again. So if you or someone you know is grieving the loss of a loved one and you need support, or you would like to talk to someone, we are here to help you. When you call the line, you will find an attentive, empathic, non-judgmental listener who will give you the time and the safe space to express your grief, to tell your story, while offering you reassurance and support and all in the strictest confidence. Volunteering on this support line is an honour and absolute privilege and such a rewarding experience. And I've actually learned a lot from listening to and accompanying the callers on their journey. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Irish Hospice Foundation for providing the platform to connect in such a meaningful way with people from all over the country who are grieving the death of loved ones, as well as other significant losses at this difficult time, and for the opportunity to help them on their journey. The line will be open from 8.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. this evening, and then as usual from Monday to Friday, uh, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Okay, back to you, Orla. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, and and thank you for the, the work that you do. Um, we've been answering some questions as we go, and sometimes we're suggesting to people, you might like to talk that through with a voice at the end of the phone. Um, so Catherine is the face of uh, one of the voices at, at the end of the phone. So, so please don't feel um, alone. Please pick up the phone. Yeah. I'm conscious we, we have spread a little bit out over our time, but um, I'm going to just ask the panel maybe to turn on their cameras so that we can ask um, a couple of questions before, before closing. Um, so, um, Brefni and Maura, Amanda and Catherine. Today, um, I, 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 we were looking at the, um, the questions and there really is um, a, a group of people who are um, bereft and usually of parents and very suddenly. So with an illness that didn't give much um, warning um, or else with a sudden death and, and different people are having different um, challenges in their grief, maybe coming to terms with the reality of it at all, even though they were present at the grief. Um, or at the death, apologies. Um, we, we have some people being very overwhelmed and, and, and emotional. Um, and another person was telling us just how confused and guilty they're, they're, they're feeling. Um, and then another person has told us it's been a little while since their uh, parent died, but they, they suddenly um, get overwhelmed with sadness. And is there a time, um, to, uh, I suppose, that... that that, that grief is easier to carry? Is there a timeline? But if we could look maybe just at, at if you have anything to say to people who've been bereaved suddenly, any advice? Yeah, I think a, a, a sudden death is, is more difficult because of the fact that we may not get a chance to say goodbye or we might know it's coming. Um, so that, that makes it more difficult. No death is easy. And, and uh, even if we do know it's coming, it's still hard. But with a sudden death, that, that can make it more um, more difficult for us. Uh, so again, it, it, 
some of the feelings that that people have been um, describing um, uh, are, are normal, and it would very much depend on the individual situation and and, and what actually happened. But it can be really helpful um, if you're finding it difficult uh, to have someone you can maybe just uh, talk that through with, or just be how you are. Um, whether that's uh, overwhelmed, again, the idea of the grief bursts, they can come and they can overwhelm us and we can feel like we're drowning. Um, uh, but that's not unusual. Uh, but I think having somebody uh, or, or someone you trust, and that can be a family member, it could be a friend, it could be somebody close to you, uh, or indeed it could be uh, someone uh, like Catherine on the bereavement support line, just to chat it through and just to maybe get a sense of being able to express some of what it is you're experiencing. Um, the suddenness makes it harder um, because it shakes us. We don't have a chance to prepare and, and it can make us uh, maybe a little less sure of ourselves. Um, uh, but it does depend on the person themselves uh, and, and the, the situation itself. Uh, I think the really important thing is if you're finding it difficult to reach out uh, for support, whether that's in your um, family, your social circle, if you've good friends, or if you find that you, you need something more to reach out uh, to some of the services that we've outlined or to the bereavement support line. Thank you, Breffney. Orla, could I just say as well, mm. I think sometimes with with sudden death, um, the shock, you, you know, you're still in shock for such a long time that you're not even dealing with mm. processing and moving towards grief because you're still in that shock phase. And I think it's, you know, I think people expect an awful lot of themselves. And sometimes within, you know, I know on reading some of the questions People are saying three weeks or four weeks mm. or six weeks mm. ago, you know, it's you're still in a state of shock almost your whole system, physically, emotionally, you're shocked to the core. And just be gentle with yourself and give yourself some time and and don't be, you know, don't expect too much of yourself. And as Brefney says, reach out and look for supports and do whatever makes do whatever works for you. And don't be pressured to feel a way that you're not ready to feel. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm just going to add a little bit there um, around the guilt idea, because I think one of the things we've observed is that it's hard to talk to somebody in your family about feeling guilty or to a friend because they often dismiss that and say, oh, don't, you shouldn't, it's fine. And, and they try and move on. So it's maybe talking to somebody outside of the family can be useful for things like that because it, it, it helps you to try and um, have an objective view on it. And it is it is a usual experience. We hear it all the time. Um, the the another question, and I think it probably related Brefni to the um, to the, the the dual process uh, model you put up there, is that somebody was talking um, about going to work and using it as a way of focusing, and therefore not so focusing on work means you're not focusing on your grief, um, but feeling that that was maybe then unsettling them. Um, and the same person asked, you know, with things like Christmas coming up, should you? take a big chunk of time and focus in on your grief or should you try and um, maybe work through Christmas with the, with the distractions? Yeah, um, and grief is unpredictable. So we don't know exactly how it's going to impact on each of us uh, uh, over, over the time. I think a couple of things around the work bit. Um, can we say at work that we're grieving? Um, uh, one man I was talking to recently who's uh, had experienced a death through suicide and he was driving a couple of months afterwards and was stopped by the guards and he realized that you know he wasn't concentrating as well and he was getting overwhelmed and uh, as he described it this big guard arrived up to him and he looked fresh out of Temple Moor and um, the guard stopped him and said like you know you were you're going or whatever and he just said to him look guard I've just had a recent bereavement and, you know, my mind was probably a bit off. And the guard said to him, are you OK? And he said what really struck him was the fact that uh, he didn't expect that kind of understanding response from the guard. Um, but it was because he took the risk to say, this is what's going on for me. I'm bereaved. 
Um, I understand that my mind mightn't be on things as much as, as it should be. Um, the, there's, he took the risk to be honest with the guard. Um, and I suppose the question maybe is, can we be honest in, in our work? Hopefully we, we get a good response. Um, but people can be very understanding when they know what's going on. Um, sometimes it's maybe about us taking the risk to reach out and, and look after ourselves by saying, look, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I've experienced a bereavement recently. I'm not feeling great or I'm not in best form. Please bear with me. And what we're doing then is we're allowing and inviting people to come in and to help us. Um, uh, uh, so that idea where, um, uh, you know, again, around over Christmas, I, I don't know that grief always works that well when we try to put it into a box and say, well, I'll do that over there. And that mightn't be what the person was suggesting. But I think, can we do that now? Can we reach out maybe now? Um, and uh, at, at the very least, let people know what's going on for us. Um, we don't have to be perfect. Uh, as Maura says, this, this isn't um, always something that, that's going to be easy or that's going to be nice or, or that's going to work. And sometimes we just have to be honest and say, I'm hurting, I'm upset or I'm exhausted or I'm just I'm sad today. Um, and that doesn't mean I'm going to be sad all day or I'm going to be sad tomorrow. But it's maybe about being in touch with our own feelings and taking the risk to say to others, this is how I am. Uh, please bear with me. Um, and if you, if you can't support me, at least understand what's going on for me. Um, and I think what that allows us maybe is, is, is to bring people in who might be able to support us. Um, of course, we're going to have some people, uh, and I think generally people mean well. Um, for some people, we, find, we might find that it's hard for somebody to, to be with us in that place. But you will find some people who can be with you. And by opening up that way, uh, you might be surprised at who you discover and the responses you get back. Um, so I suppose my answer there would be to try and think, can we do some of that now? Can mm -hmm. we open up a little bit now um, and, you know, allow ourselves to be helped and allow ourselves just to be how we are? Um, uh, that might be a, a, a way. And, and then the answer around what to do over Christmas might become a bit clearer um, by doing some of that maybe now. Mm -hmm. um, because the other thing is, you know, other people, you don't know what's going on in other people's lives. And, and we might be surprised at, at, at the support we might get. Thank you, Breffney. That's that's good advice. Um, and and again, chimed with some other questions um, about maybe not wanting to let people know how you feel because they might feel bad. Um, so let's yeah. let's look after ourselves and yeah. not other people. I, th I um, think grief grief allows us to be selfish, and I think we need to be selfish in times. that way of let other people look after themselves. You've enough to do to look after yourself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And just um, again, conscious of time, I'm just going to ask one more question and I'm going to ask it of, of Catherine because maybe this type of thing comes up on the line where, where we have a person who, who was talking about, you know, being estranged from a, a family because of bereavement. You know, that, that bereavement is, it, of course, an individual feels it, but it happens in the context of your, of your family. Um, would that be a sort of an appropriate call for the helpline? Absolutely. Uh, um, many people can feel, especially during the pandemic, estranged from family because they can't get together, you know, and it's really, really difficult. So we've had a number of calls in the line, particularly around that. And, you know, how can they overcome it? What can they do to make them feel better? You know, what, what's the way forward? So I would suggest maybe, you know, even though you can't get together, you can maybe use Zoom or WhatsApp or, you know, light a candle at a particular time or whatever it is, you know, you don't have to be alone just because you can't come together. But, you know, you can you can still phone each other or, you know, reach out to someone that you know and someone that you can be yourself with. So, you know, someone you trust and you can be yourself with. But, uh, yeah, strangers from the family can be particularly, you know, grief. The COVID-19 has really compounded grief and has really yes. made things worse. So yeah. it's important to reach out in what, whatever way you can, you know, if not physically come together, you know, to, to reach out and maybe make that phone call or whatever it is, you know. Yeah, 
I think I think that's very true. And if there's conflict in a family, which let's face this, you know, many, many families have and um, grief can magnify that. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I really liked what both of you have said, um, which is try and be yourself. And I think more uh, what you said was lovely about be gentle on yourself. And I think if we went away with uh, one message that that would be important not to have too high an expectation of ourselves. Um, Amanda, was there anything um, from those questions that that you would particularly direct people towards? Um, I didn't look at the questions because I... Okay, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) But is there anything that you noticed that came up that I could answer from a, a service perspective? Well, one very particular one is, are there weekend camps for bereaved families? Um. I don't know if there, oh, there's um, bereaved families, Barrettstown and Annam Cara would run uh, kind of weekends. So at the end of the t- tonight, I'm going to run a slide. If you want to contact them either through email or their website, they're the only ones that I'm aware that do have camps. But if there's a particular area or particular bereavement, um, contact us and we'll find out for you. Okay. okay. Thank you for that, Amanda. Just noticed some questions there, Orla, around suicide and again, how we might handle a suicide mm-hmm. death and talking to people around a death. Um, I would say Pieta uh, is a very good resource and um, they've a lot of very experienced people who've handled a lot of situations around suicide bereavement. Um, that would be a good place to go in terms of getting some advice on, on how to handle those situations and also support if you yourself need it. Excellent. Thank you for that, Brefni. Um, and I'm, I'm very conscious now um, that we have gone over time. And, um, and I'm also very conscious that looking at the numbers that, that, that you've all stayed with us. Um, and I hope that some of, of the information um, has been useful. And, and I remind you that while you might feel alone, you've, you've been in a, a, a collective space. Um, we are going to stay here and answer any questions that weren't answered. Um, and as we said, the, the telephone line is, is open for you and will be open through the week. Um, I, I suppose in, in, in saying goodbye, um, that, uh, that piece about being good to yourself um, and maybe remembering the, the candle that we had at the beginning and what we had hoped for it was that it would give you just a, you know, a little bit of light in the darkness um, and, and, and maybe a, a, a glimmer of hope, um, acknowledging that this is a very hard time. Um, I'm going to finish up by asking my, my colleague Maura John to, um, to read a poem, a, a John O'Donoghue poem. And um, after that poem, um, we'll, we'll close off. You won't, you won't see us anymore. You'll, you'll just see the, the slides. Um, so by way of closing, um, I, I invite Maura to send on or to turn on her camera. Are you there, Maura? I am. I wasn't going to turn on. That's okay, too. That's okay, no, too. There we go. There we go. Okay. okay. Thank you, Maura. And the rest of us are, are leaving you now, um, and our thoughts are with you. Um, take good care. Bye For bye. Grief. Thank you, everybody. For grief by John O'Donoghue. When you lose someone you love, your life becomes strange, the ground beneath you gets fragile. Your thoughts make your eyes unsure, and some dead echo drags your voice down where words have no confidence. Your heart has grown heavy with loss, and though this loss has wounded others too, no one knows what has been taken from you when the silence of absence deepens. Flickers of guilt kindle regret for all that was left unsaid or undone. There are days when you wake up happy, again inside the fullness of life, until the moment breaks and you are thrown back onto the black tide of loss. Days when you have your heart back, you are able to function well, until in the middle of work or encounter, suddenly with no warning, you are ambushed by grief. It becomes hard to trust yourself, 
all you can depend on now is that sorrow will remain faithful to itself. More than you, it knows its way and will find the right time to pull and pull the rope of grief until that coiled hill of tears has reduced to its last drop. Gradually, you will learn acceptance with the invisible form of your departed. And when the work of grief is done, the wound of loss will heal and you will have learned to wean your eyes from that gap in the air and be able to enter the heart in your soul where your loved one has awaited your return all the time.